Hey everybody, so this section is on blood spatter and um, here's the thing, with this section of this unit um, some people can get a little grossed out so if you're feeling queasy just pause it, come back to it if you need to, okay? Alright, so blood spatter itself has been used in investigative cases since 1894. In 1939 the meaning of the splatter pattern was first analyzed to determine the meaning of the pattern. When a wound is inflicted, a blood splatter pattern may be created. Now, it takes a grouping of blood stains to make a splatter pattern, or splatter pattern, sorry. So, one droplet, not enough, needs to be a grouping of stains. The pattern itself then can be used to reconstruct the events surrounding a shooting, stabbing, or beating. Now, when we analyze it, we can find out and determine the direction the blood was traveling, the angle of impact for the injury, the point of origin of the blood, where was the victim, the velocity of the blood, how fast was it traveling, and then as a result of all of those, in most cases, the manner of death. Now, blood has a cohesive nature, just like water does. So remember in biology when you did the put the drops of water on top of the penny probably in order to determine its cohesive nature, see how many drops you could get to fit on there before it spilled over. Blood acts much the same way. So all the cells are remain tightly attracted to each other. So when they drop from a 90 degree angle they tend um, to the ground, they tend to form really round droplets. Now when blood falls from a height or at a high velocity it can overcome that natural cohesiveness and form what we call satellite droplets. So look up at the top and right over here is an example of a satellite droplet. It's a small portion that actually broke away from the larger droplet itself. Now when it falls onto a less than smooth surface it can form what we call spiking patterns. So now if I get my cursor back here these would be considered spiking patterns that are sticking out. Okay, now um, I've got a link here to four different phases of impact and I'm going to go ahead and click on it and of course my computer is not going to cooperate with me probably very well but what we want to do is we would like to take a look at the four phases of impact here is it going to go? is it going? it's thinking wait for it wait for it alright good so here we go now um, Basically, you've got a side view of a blood droplet and a top view on the blood droplet. So what we want to do is observe the droplet as it falls in order to observe its impact. So when I click next, we're going to see what happens as the droplet falls. So as it falls down, it, is, it goes through what we call phase one, and that's contact and collapse. So the force of the surface that it's hitting causes it to expand. Then we see displacement where the edges of the droplet literally kind of pop back up as a result of that impact and then the spikes or dispersion occurs and so this is where that the blood is starting to overcome its cohesive nature and then the spikes land down and we call that retraction when it retracts down to the surface so pretty cool here it is all in one motion okay alright so um, when we study those splatter patterns, there are six basic patterns that we can observe. So we're going to describe each of these. Okay? The first type are called passive drops, and these are going to be circular droplets with secondary satellites. Now, I had videos in here. Let's see if they are going to work. I don't know if they will. Uh, it looks like it's not going to work, unfortunately. I apologize, you guys. So, um, the passive drops, again, typically not a lot of movement. Blood is just dripping off of a, a source, um, and it hits the ground. Then there are what we call arterial gushes. Um, and arterial gushes are just that. An artery's been hit, and so because of the heart still pumping, it is causing the blood to spray out at... Um, different pressures and a lot of times we can see that along a wall 
um, in varying heights. There are also what is called splashes, and those splashes tend to make kind of exclamation points. So if somebody coughs or sneezes or chokes, um, something like that, sometimes there are splashes of blood that can come out. Then there are smears, and so you can see an upside down handprint there. And this is where touches, um, there are touches or brushes against a firm surface where you wouldn't be able to get any fingerprints or palm prints, but we would still be able to see the placement of the hand, but it's been smeared. Trails are another one. I'm not even going to try to make the video go here. Um, but obviously, this is going to be someone is walking away. Either they're injured or the weapon is dripping with blood. It doesn't matter. Um, but those are going to produce kind of round, smeared, and sometimes even spurts, um, depending on the severity or the location of the injury. And then there are what we call pools of blood. Um, and that's going to leave large amounts of blood in one spot, typically from the victim. <clears throat> now, when we look at the directionality of the blood, um, when a blood drop no longer become or is as wide as it is possible to, de it, it's possible then to determine the angle that it was traveling. So we have cohesion. Again, this is blood attracted to blood. There's adhesion, that's when blood is attracted to another surface. And then there's the surface tension of the droplet. And this is an elastic characteristic of the outer edge of that surface of the droplet. Now, the shape of an individual blood drop provides a clue to the direction from where the blood origin originated, and that's called the point of origin. This can be determined by measuring the width as well as the length of the droplet. So, how do you think the point of impact is going to compare with the rest of the blood pattern? Well, at the point of impact, it's going to be darker and it's going to be wider. So when we look up at this blood droplet up here, here's the point of impact, right? But see how there's the trail over here? That points in the direction that the blood was coming from. All right. Oops. How did I end up going forward twice? Didn't want to do that. So when we look at the impact um, as a result of some of that spray or splatter, we can sometimes determine the velocity of the impact. And high velocity is where the size of the droplets that we can measure are literally less than a millimeter. Um, and this is when the blood is traveling at 100 feet per second. And that's typically going to be because of a gunshot wound. A medium velocity, the size of the droplets is going to be anywhere from 1 to 4, and this is going to be traveling at about 25 feet per second. That's going to, an example of that would be um, beating or stabbing. And then there's the low velocity, in which we see much larger droplets, um, 4 to 6 millimeters in diameter, and the blood travels much slower. Um, and that's going to be something that we call blunt um, object impact. So somebody was hit with a hammer or a bat or something like that. The blood travels much slower at five feet per second. And um, also, we can determine the location of the origin of the blood. So when we look at um, the blood droplets, those tails, again, are indicating which direction it was traveling. But if there are at least two um, spatters or spots, drops, whatever you want to call them, we can indicate typically what was the location of the victim when they were hit. So we call these the lines of convergence. Basically, you draw straight lines down the axis of the blood splatters, excuse me, to indicate where those lines converge. Wherever that would be on an x and y axis, that's what indicates the point of origin of the blood. And that's where we're going to stop for this section.